Hey everyone, here we are in another C3 TV leadership session. I love doing these, especially when we're talking about discipling and mentoring and delegating, creating a team around us to accomplish the great work of God. And uh, just to understand right from the start, God works like a team. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, He's a team. God is a team all the way through Scripture. Very rarely do you find God just choosing a man all on his own to operate. In fact, whenever people got on their own, they got into trouble. Samson, think of him, just a non-team player and uh, found himself in all, all kinds of difficulty. And uh, when you find David alone in Jerusalem and all of his army have gone off, he got into all sorts of trouble. When Elijah left his servant and wandered into the wilderness. He, he was suicidal. He said, I, I just want to die. He was because he was isolated and on his own. We are meant to do life together and in structured relationships. Uh, and many of those relationships are going to be where we have a mentor or a teacher, uh, somebody guiding us and instructing us. And we are the taught, the mentee, or else we are the mentor and teaching others. And we should have both of those relationships going on in our lives. One of the greatest gifts to learn uh, in our lives or, or greatest traits to learn in our lives is how to change gear between being taught and then being the teacher, between being led and then being the leader. And we have got to understand that because God, because we are all submitted to God and He is, we've got to learn to be taught by God and not push back on Him, and He will teach us through people uh, more often than not, 90, 99% of the time. Sometimes it will be directly into our lives through a supernatural encounter, but mostly we will find that God is guiding us, influencing us, directing us through other people, sometimes through books, sometimes through preachers, sometimes through personal contact, but there will be influences in our lives that are to guide us. And one of the greatest characteristics you can ever develop is teachability the ability to say yes. A repentant heart will take God's side against itself. Repentance is me taking God's side against me. So whenever uh, somebody has a legitimate correction to bring, I'm going, thank you, amen, that's good. I'm gonna take that on board. I didn't see that. I'm glad you alerted me to that. I'm telling you, faithful are the, uh, are the rebukes of a friend. The wounds of a friend are, are faithful. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. People who flatter you uh, and encouragement can drift into that flattery thing. Uh, it doesn't feel good. You feel like you got grease all over you. Th that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about discipling people means I am encouraging them and loving them, but I also have a capacity to talk about difficult issues when, when I need to. Not all the time. I find that in most discipling relationships that I have, it would be very rare, It'd be like 5% of the time that most of it is you're doing a great job, you're going well. I find that once uh, you're able to bring adjustment and correction uh, and people accept it and you see a difference in their behaviour and the way they, their attitude or the, the way they talk or walk, then... Uh, you, you know that you're on a great learning track. And from then on, I've found that people who have a teachable attitude, they actually learn without you actually needing to say anything. They get it. They say, yep, I'm there. They're on the same page. They can, they can be self-taught on all sorts of areas that, uh, that you don't need to actually alert them to. So coming to one of the greatest discipling moments in uh, the New Testament is when Jesus empowers His disciples to do what He's been doing. Matthew 9, 36, when He saw the crowds, He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So He said to His disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but workers are few. Therefore pray for workers. And then He says in, in 
Matthew 10, 1, when He had called His 12 disciples to Him, He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. This is, this is amazing, okay? Because Jesus sees a problem. He sees these thousands and thousands of people who are harassed. How many people do you know in the world today who are harassed, harassed with anxiety, depression, torment, guilt, all kinds of hatreds and unforgiveness and opinions uh, that are coming against them and criticism, all kinds of harassments, frustrations, aggravations, angers. That word harassed is very poignant, I feel. And Jesus just sees people harassed everywhere, upset, angry, distressed, disturbed, all kinds of things. And He says, He he doesn't say, I've got to go fix it all. He says, no, what I'm going to do is make disciples and empower them to actually go and fix this up, to go and make disciples themselves. And I have found that making, coming into people's worlds from a disciple making angle fixes up their issues way quicker when we're not just trying to solve the problem, but actually do a life development moment. And so that they then when they themselves begin to make disciples, they find that the problems they're experiencing also get swallowed up a whole lot quicker. So the whole disciple making concept that Jesus introduces us to is so powerful at being a positive answer to a negative world. The books that I've written on discipleship, my most recent book, Disciple, we we cover this area of making disciples. If I'm a disciple, then I'm making disciples. I've got to be, be able to identify one, two or three people in my world that could do my job so that I could be seamlessly transitioned out of whatever I'm doing in whatever area. And I think every person in the Kingdom of God should have that mindset that whatever role we are fulfilling, we have somebody else alongside of us that we are also including with us that trains them, talks to them and we give them jobs that we are doing so that we're able to actually give them feedback. That's called disciple making. In organisations, some organisations we'd call it delegation. Whatever we want to call it, it is preparing a next generation with what we have. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, Paul said to Timothy, the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's four generations of disciple making. He's saying, Paul, the things you've heard from me, Paul, Timothy, I want you to commit those to faithful men who then will be able to teach others also. So Paul was saying, whatever I've given you, Timothy, I want you to give to others. And I want those that you give that to, to give it to others after them. That's four generations of disciple making. So uh, in the Old Testament, it was a law that fathers tell their children about the great things that God had done for them. And then the law was to go on to each generation so that they would keep remembering God. And in one of those Psalms, it says, Ephraim turned back in the day of battle, even though it was fully, that tribe was fully armed. They had the equipment, but they didn't have the heart. And it says they forgot what God had done for them. Why did they forget? Because because people stopped telling them how great God was and the power that God could bring to bear on enemies when we engage in the battle. And so when we stop generationally informing people about what God can do, the the ways of God, the the patterns of God, the, the rhythms of Christ in our life, when we stop actually having classes, Bible colleges, situations, connect groups, church life where we're able to keep 
talking these things through, the church will start to die because it's built on us actually making disciples. And that's what Paul was calling Timothy to do in those days. And he was taking it, the example from Jesus in this, in this scripture that we've read. So coming back to the scripture, Jesus says, I want you to pray for workers. Now, I've never found God uses idle people. Working for God is work. It's emotional work, mental work, physical work. It's not like digging concrete, digging dirt or pouring concrete. It can feel that level of strain sometimes. Somebody said they, uh, they put a power meter on Billy Graham uh, when he was preaching once. And, and in one message, he expended the same energy as a man digging earth for eight hours. And, and I think that we underestimate the level of energy that we are putting out every time we preach or we teach and we need to make sure we're recovering, make sure we're prepared, make sure we're strong and fit for the job that's ahead of us. Uh, uh, Charles um, Wesley, John Wesley, all of them were hard, hard workers. When you read their journals, uh, it is interesting to read what level of, of work they did, starting at four in the morning, finishing at 10 at night, writing a lot of the day, preaching five times a day. They certainly were not lazy people. They work. Jesus said, pray for workers. Pray for men and women who don't think the ministry is a, a, a desirable job because it's easy. Never imagine that. If, if you're ever going to serve God, it will be working. And, and when you see God calling people, he, he never calls idle people. They're either mending their nets or they're out fishing or they're dragging a boat up or Amos is shepherding sheep. Uh, Moses is out the back shepherding sheep and he sees the, the bush on fire. People were active when God called them. Think of Elisha when Elijah threw his cape over him. He was plowing behind some cows. And, and don't be thinking, oh, if I just wait around for the call of God, I'll wait, I'll, I'll wait till I hear that before I do anything. Get involved, work hard, and then you'll find God's looking and He says, let's get this guy. Let's get this Gideon who's threshing wheat in the wine press. God calls busy people. So he says, pray for workers and pray that God would send out laborers into his harvest. And so the very next chapter, the first verse, which is like the next verse uh, in the writing, he called his 12 disciples to him. That's important. That's really important really important. The first call on our lives is not to people, it is to Him. He called His disciples to Himself. You read in the book of Acts, they ministered to the Lord. That's worship, that's praise. God is looking for worshipers, people who will minister to Him in the heavens. In the Old Testament, it was told the Levites were an entire tribe in Israel, if you like, who were to minister to the Lord. And the prophets called for the people to minister to God. It's interesting that it, because we forget this sometimes. We think our ministry is to people, but our first ministry is actually to the Lord. The scripture in Chronicles 7.14 where the, the call is, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, not my hand, seek me. Jeremiah says, you will find me when you seek for me with all your heart. So God wants to be not just part of our life. He wants to be number one, the first calling in our life is to Him as ministers. Our first priority is God. And we've lived in a culture so often that has excluded God from the entire equation that we need to aggressively come back. And in those first five points of the Lord's Prayer, which are all to do with God, not us, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, 
your kingdom come, your will be done. The first five prayers of the Lord's Prayer are for God, for His will. And to shift our perspective of the idea that God's barely involved in the human race and we, we conveniently remember Him when, when, it's, when it's important for us. Uh, but we need to remember Him when it's important for Him because He is the Lord of the universe. He is the ruler of it all. He is the creator of it all. And we are His subjects, His servants to minister to Him. And so that is what Jesus is saying. I am calling you to me first, His disciples. He didn't call the crowd. He, he didn't call the gathering. He didn't call the congregation. He called the disciples. People who live by discipline. People who have presented themselves to God, as Paul says in Romans 12, wholly acceptable to God, useful for His purpose. They didn't come like a broken down bike with no seat and bent wheels and the bell doesn't work. They came, disciple, here I am, Lord, ready for you. The disciples came to Christ. They'd stuck with Him, followed Him through many different situations so far. And He, and he says to them, Look, I'm going to give you power. I want you to cast out unclean spirits, to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. The next verse says, now the names of the apostles was. So they came as disciples, they received power and left as apostles. Incredible. Jesus in one moment of power impartation transformed ordinary people into extraordinary people. None of these guys were extraordinary in themselves. They were all from vastly different backgrounds. Some were accountants, others were like tax collectors, others were zealots, political zealots, others were fishermen, others were menders of nets down at the fishing thing, like in the same role as fishermen. Some were uh, different, they were like poets, like people who were writing and writers, authors. Uh, they, they, were, they were just vastly different people, vastly different. And, but none of them would have ever have been famous in their own right, extraordinary in their own right. But now Jesus gave them the power that He had in His life. And that is the essence of delegation. It is the essence of disciple making, that we give other people what we have. The reason I have a pulpit is so I can give it to other people. I'm not the only one who teaches in our courses. I'm, not, but I'm, I'm at the le, way at the less percentage of the bulk of teachers that we have in our Bible college and in our whole movement, in our church. I make sure that whatever God has given, that I give it to other people to the point where there are things that I do that only I can do, but a lot of the things are things that other people can do and should be doing, are decisions that they should be making and not me. And so as we empower people with decision-making privileges, with empowerment of authority and position, with empowerment that is spiritual, which is what Jesus gave them, and on that basis, they would find themselves bringing revival and starting churches in so many places throughout Palestine. So this is Jesus delegating, giving away what He had in His life. He wasn't trying to protect and have a monopoly on, on the power of God. I'm, I'm the one who heals the sick. I'm the one who casts out demons. He gave it away. When people come to me, asking me to pray for them, for the baptism of the Spirit, I say, oh, you need to see that person. They'll do a much better job. Come to me for counselling. I say, you need to go to that person. Come to me for a decision about something. I say, what would you do about this? And get their decision. When people come and say, look, um, can you speak in this circumstance? I say, you'll do a great job. And they say, I've never spoken before. I say, I believe you'll do an incredible work in that moment. Rather than trying to occupy every space, maybe God gives us what we have to send others into those spaces and let them rise and rejoice in it. Be secure. When they do well, get really happy. Give them feedback every now and then. But overall, love your disciples, build them up, encourage them, and you'll create an army. You'll create a team that is so effective in building the kingdom. God bless you. <laughs>